Today at 6, a deal is struck to try to avoid any sh food shortages caused by the energy crisis. Carbon dioxide is essential for food production. Uh, the UK's biggest supplier stopped work because of high gas prices, but now it's agreed to restart. The deal will come just in time for the winter market, as some food manufacturers race against the clock. We have a three-week window to get these orders packed and out into the other areas of the world where they're needed for Christmas. We'll have more on what's been agreed and on the future of smaller energy companies struggling with rising costs. Also on the programme. A third Russian man faces charges following the Salisbury poison attack, which left one dead and three people critically ill. A BBC study finds children with mental health problems in England are facing long waits for treatment. And in the Canary Islands, another village on La Palma is evacuated as the volcano destroys a new area. And coming up on the BBC News Channel, all four home nations are in action this evening in World Cup qualifying. England's women take on Luxembourg, chasing a second win under their new manager. Good evening. A deal has been struck with the US firm that supplies most of the carbon dioxide that's used in food production in the UK. It is widely used in the food industry, in brewing and in packaging for meat and salads to prolong shelf life. Now, the recent sharp rise in gas prices led to CF Industries stopping work at two factories, which then led to a shortage of CO2. And one food industry group warned that consumers would start noticing gaps on supermarket shelves within days if there was no intervention. Ministers have not revealed what kind of incentives they've offered CF Industries to restart their production. Our business editor, Simon Jack, has the latest. When you think of cheese, you probably don't consider carbon dioxide a vital ingredient. It's not in the cheese itself, but like many other food products, CO2 is used in the packaging process to extend shelf life. The boss of this cheese producer has been told by his supplier his CO2 deliveries are in jeopardy at a crucial time of year. We're now um, pretty near empty on our stocks and we're living hand to mouth you know, on a day to day basis. So at a time of year when we should be packing more and more products for export ready for Christmas, we're having to tap back the production based on some sort of forecast for CO2. CF Industries, a US-owned company with plants in Cheshire and Teesside, produces 60% of the UK's CO2 as a byproduct of manufacturing fertilizer. It may be a byproduct to them, it's absolutely crucial to the economy, which is why the government had to do a deal to restart production fast. From the farmyard gate to the supermarket door, CO2 finds its way into processes and packagings throughout the food supply chain. And the fact that government has been locked in talks to try and figure out how to subsidise one company's gas bill shows you just how urgent they think the situation is and how pervasive and damaging high gas prices can be for the whole economy. Wholesale prices are now higher than companies are allowed to charge under a government cap, so many suppliers are going bust, leaving customers like Stacey having to pay more to a new supplier. When I looked for a comparable deal on Sunday night, the price was going to cost me £550 more. If I was going to get a 12-month fixed um, tariff, it was going to cost over £900. Those prices have increased already, and many of the deals have actually disappeared. So I am now shackled to my gas meter. The government price cap has already been increased and will take effect in October, but the calculation of that new cap didn't capture a 70% surge in wholesale prices in August. The regulator says it's likely that prices will rise again. We've already announced a rise in the price cap that's coming in in October, so that, that is already in play. And although there is a lot of cost pressure, and yes, that will feed through to Bells, it's very early in the cycle and it's too early to predict what will happen next year. But of course, as the underlying cost change, ultimately that cost does feed through to Bells. As some smaller companies go bust, the boss of a challenger company that now rivals the giants say we mustn't go back to the days when a handful of powerful companies dominated the market. We do not want an energy market that has insufficient competition. 
right? We don't want an energy market which is made up of companies that are basically all the same. What we need is to have the diversity of customer offering that we've got used to with competition. The government insists that help for carbon dioxide producer CF is a one-off, as CO2 is critical to cool nuclear reactors, medicines and vaccines. The wider crisis in the energy market remains unresolved. Simon Jack, BBC News. Speaking in New York, where he's been attending a meeting at the United Nations, uh, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson said the government would do all it could to protect consumers. But with prices rising for energy and food and reductions to universal credit on the way, some Conservatives have warned of a very tough winter ahead for many people, a warning that the Prime Minister rejected today. His comments were made ahead of a planned meeting with President Biden in Washington, and they are expected to discuss the COP26 Global Climate Conference in Glasgow, taking place later this year, as well as the ongoing challenges in Afghanistan following the military withdrawal. Our political editor, Laura Kunzberg, sent this report. Even prime ministers have to use the sidewalk sometimes. The United Nations gathering snarls up New York's crazy traffic. But Boris Johnson can't look away from real problems close to home. Prime Minister, you're over here. The energy price rise as dizzying as this view. We'll do what we can to protect consumers in this interim period. And I want to stress that it is an interim period. And I think what people uh, want to, to see is the, the medium long-term strategy. But what people want, at home want to know, Prime Minister, is what is going to happen to their energy bill. Yes. What is going to happen in the next few weeks and months? People at home are hearing about possible shortages on supermarket shelves. People are seeing energy companies go under. First of all, the market uh, across the world is going to start clearing these problems and they, they, will, they will rectify themselves. But secondly, uh, what it's showing is why it's absolutely right to be investing in wind, to be investing in, in solar, but also to be putting in nuclear. So if you look at our 10-point plan but for, for the Green Industrial me, Revolution... Forgive me, Prime uh, Minister, Laura, I, think at the moment, I think at the moment people would like to know how they're going to put food on the table in the next few weeks and months, well, rather than thinking about yeah. a long-term 10-point plan. Just, just, just on that, people, look on but, that, Laura, but, if, I may, if I may, I don't believe that people will be, uh, will be short of food, and wages are actually rising... Uh, now under this government, if that's what you're driving but at. Wages are, are now rising, rising under this government Minister, for the first time but, in decades, Minister, and that is a great thing. The theme. government is going to remove £20 a week from some families who believe they really cannot afford that. Now, do you really understand the pressure that some people are feeling at home? Yes, and that's why uh, we've raised the uh, living wage by the, the record uh, amount, and that's why uh, we are doing everything we can to help people, as we have done throughout this pandemic. But, Prime Minister, but Prime Minister, people are seeing decades. prices rise. They are seeing a government that for millions of people are going to take away £20 a week. It's all very well for you to stand on the top of a skyscraper in New York and say you understand. If you really understood... And you're also on top why of a skyscraper, in, and we're, in, and we're indeed, here to get the world it, to focus but, on, but if you on, really on tackling climate but change. Prime Minister, if and you, one of the things that we're doing is, is trying to get people to move away uh, from hydrocarbons, from reliance on hydrocarbons, to putting in clean, green energy sources on which our country can uh, rely. An industry source told me the Prime Minister on his travels simply hasn't understood how serious things are. But a journey of a few hundred miles to the White House is Boris Johnson's priority tonight. I think that uh, the relations between the UK and the US are about as good as they've been for a, for a very long time. Uh, things are working very, very well. One of the great advantages of working with uh, Joe Biden and his, and his White House is that they are passionately committed to fixing uh, climate change. The UK will be cheered by the president's promise of more cash for the climate to help other countries go green. Only hours, though, now, until back in Washington, the two men will be one on one. Let's make our better future now. Laura Kunzberg, BBC News, Washington, D.C. Well, President Biden told the United Nations that he would double the amount of money uh, that the U.S. is giving to help the developing world to adapt to global warming. It will now contribute more than £8 billion to a special fund. Mr Biden told the UN General Assembly he wanted America to be a world leader in climate finance. Uh, listening carefully to every word was our North America editor, John Sopel, who joins us now from the White House. Um, John, for you, what did this speech tell us about uh, the president's focus, if you like, his ambitions in the next few years? Well, I think that 
just take the climate change example to start with, which the Brits were cheering because it's something they have been lobbying for very hard. I think that Joe Biden wanted to present himself as a much more outward looking president, much more willing to engage in the world's issues, less nationalistic than Donald Trump who went before him. And he wanted to turn the page on Afghanistan, which was a kind of ghastly summer uh, for Joe Biden and talk about we're moving from a period of relentless war to relentless diplomacy. I think he also wanted to show leadership in the battle against China. He didn't mention China by name, but he talked about how he didn't want a Cold War but would stand up to authoritarianism. Now, all of this is fine. It's what the Western leaders wanted to hear. But when he said, we're not going to go it alone, we're going to act with our allies, well, that's exactly what he didn't do over Afghanistan. And that's why I think there'll be many people who were listening to what Joe Biden had to say who will treat it with some scepticism. John, many thanks again. John Sopel there, our North America editor, with his uh, analysis at the White House. A third Russian man is facing charges over his alleged involvement in the Salisbury poisonings of 2018, which left one person dead and three critically ill. Uh, security sources believe that Denis Sergeyev controlled the operation uh, when Novichok poison was used against Sergei Skripal, a former Russian spy, and his daughter Yulia. A British woman, Dawn Sturgis, died after coming into contact with the poison. Our security correspondent, Gordon Carrera, has the latest details. The third man, Denis Sergeyev, today charged with the Salisbury poisonings. It was March 2018 when deadly nerve agent was deployed on the streets of the city. The target, Sergei Skripal. He and his daughter fell ill after Novichok was smeared on his door handle. Four months later, Dawn Sturgis died after she came into contact with a discarded perfume bottle used to carry it. Today, the Prime Minister called on Russia to act. They should recognise that our sense uh, uh, that justice must be done uh, is not abated. And uh, Dawn Sturgis, an innocent member of the British public, uh, died in that event. And we want to see uh, those suspects handed over. Police today released a new image of Sergeyev arriving at Heathrow on the Friday before the poisoning. The other two members of the team flew into Gatwick hours later. They were spotted heading to Salisbury and around the town. Sergeyev stayed in London the whole weekend, including spending time near here. But police say the three men did meet on multiple occasions in the city. And security sources have told me that Sergeyev was the on-the-ground operational commander for the team. Sergeyev is then seen leaving Heathrow for Moscow almost immediately after the poisoning. Police today confirmed all three were members of Russian military intelligence, the GRU, and had operated internationally. So who is Denis Sergeyev? He's a veteran of Russian special forces, who then joined Unit 29155 of the GRU, where he's now thought to be a major general. The unit is said to be tasked with sabotage, subversion and assassination. Since Salisbury, European security services have been tracking its movements. This year it was linked to an explosion at a Czech arms depot, which killed two people in 2014, and to the attempted assassination of a Bulgarian arms dealer. The man seen in this CCTV may well be Denis Sergeyev, suspected of smearing poison on a car door handle. The first two Salisbury suspects appeared on Russian TV to claim they were just tourists visiting the cathedral, and Moscow has consistently denied any involvement. That means that despite today's accusation, the third man, also believed to be in Russia, is unlikely to face a British court. Gordon Carrera, BBC News. Earlier today, Moscow rejected what it has called an unsubstantiated ruling by the European Court of Human Rights, which found that Russia was responsible for the killing of the former KGB officer Alexander Litvinenko in London back in 2006. Mr Litvinenko, who became a British citizen, was fatally poisoned with uh, radioactive polonium-210, which was put in his tea. A public inquiry conducted a decade later concluded that the killing was probably approved by President Putin. The family of the teenager Harry Dunn, who died when his motorbike was struck by a car in Northamptonshire in 2019, say that they've reached a settlement in a civil claim for damages against the wife of an American diplomat. 
Anne Sokolas was able to leave the UK shortly after the crash, claiming diplomatic immunity, and she refused to return. Our correspondent, Graeme Satchel, is at the US Embassy in South London. Graeme, what else do we know about this statement? Well, Hugh, the family are describing this as a pivotal moment, a milestone in their campaign. You'll remember that Anne Sekoulis was charged with the criminal offence of causing death by dangerous driving. But because she claimed diplomatic immunity and left the country, there was no chance of pursuing that criminal claim. So the family all the way through this have said that it just isn't right that someone can be involved in such a serious accident and in effect just walk away. So they did what was the only avenue left open to them and started a civil claim in America claiming damages for wrongful death. That was due to go to a full trial at the end of this year. Today we learn that both sides have reached a resolution. We don't know exactly the detail of it. We don't know how much money Mr. Koulis has had to pay the Dunn family. But the Dunn say they are relieved by this outcome and remain as determined as ever that Ms. Koulis should face some sort of criminal trial in the future. Graham, many thanks again for the latest there in uh, South London at the US Embassy. Graham Satchel. Now, the time is uh, just coming up to 16 minutes past six, and uh, our main story this evening. A deal is struck with carbon dioxide producers to try to avoid any food shortages caused by the energy crisis. And coming up... And then you squish your hands together to fire the mustard into the ceiling. A rare insight into the Duke of Edinburgh's practical jokes in a new BBC One documentary. Coming up in Sports Day on the BBC News Channel, a changing of the guard at England Rugby. Eddie Jones names eight uncapped players for his upcoming training camp and leaves some big names behind. Children with mental health problems are facing long waits for treatment in England, with parents saying that they are desperate for help. A BBC investigation has found that a fifth of patients waited longer than 12 weeks, uh, with one area having an average gap of almost nine months between being referred and being treated. Our health correspondent Sophie Hutchinson has been meeting some of the parents who say that they really are very keen to get help for their children. Uh, the report contains some details which you may find upsetting. When things get tough, this is where Sue comes. Her teenage daughter, who's self-harmed, has been waiting for mental health treatment for almost two and a half years. We don't know how long it's going to be before she receives help, but when she does receive that help, you know, we don't know now how she's going to engage with that because of the wait. Um, and as I say, you know, I, I do wonder if as a result of those delays, you know, she might end up needing medication because the anxiety is now so high. It's estimated in England 1.5 million under 18 year olds have a probable mental health disorder. But in the year to 2021, the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Service, CAMS, saw just under a third of them. Your teachers here really, really care about you. Some teachers are so concerned, they're telling parents not to bother with CAMS. When I have parents that are in a really desperate situation, I'm often reluctant to refer them on to these services because I know the length of time that they'll wait. And sometimes there just isn't that opportunity to wait. You need that support right there, right then. The government says due to the pandemic, it's treating more under 18s than ever and extending help to an additional 345,000 children and young people. We have a, a young girl who is set upon dying. Sandra, not her real name, has to lock away the knives and medicines at home. You get told to call the crisis team who are never there in times of crisis because you can only have a crisis between 8am and 6pm and then you get referred to adult services who just say, ring an ambulance. Her 16-year-old daughter has waited three years for treatment despite attempting suicide 17 times. The consequence of having to wait this long is that it's done an awful lot of psychiatric damage to her, really. How painful is that to you? It's devastating. She is so talented. She's amazing at art and music. She's really creative. But when you are constantly trying to just keep your daughter alive another day to hope that someone will give her some therapy, sorry. <laughs> After five suicide attempts this summer, Sandra's daughter was referred for therapy. And Sue's daughter 
has finally got an appointment, but it's thought many hundreds of thousands of other children are still being left without the help they need. Sophie Hutchinson, BBC News. If you've been affected by the issues raised in that report, you can go to bbc.co.uk forward slash action line for details of organisations which offer information and support, or you can call free at any time to hear some recorded information on 0800 066 066. Let's have a look then at the latest official uh, figures on the pandemic in the UK. There were 31,564 new infections recorded in the latest 24-hour period. That means in the past week an average of 31,083 new cases per day. The latest figures showed uh, over 7,700 people with COVID are being treated uh, in hospital in the UK. Another 203 deaths have been recorded of people who died within 28 days of a positive COVID test. The average number of deaths per day in the past week is now 144. On vaccinations, 89.4% of people aged 16 or over in the UK have had first jab and 81.9% are now double vaccinated. Staff, pupils and parents at Rushy Green Primary School in South East London are said to be devastated by the death of one of their teachers. Sabina Nessa was described as kind, caring and absolutely dedicated to her pupils. Her death is being treated by police as suspected murder and a man in his 40s who was arrested on suspicion of killing her has been released while further investigations continue. The former Conservative Health Secretary, Lord Fowler, has offered his deep sympathies to thousands of NHS patients who were treated with contaminated blood products in the 1980s. Thousands of people died as a result. Patients with haemophilia and other disorders were given blood infected with HIV and hepatitis, uh, going back to the late 70s and then into the 1980s. The Defence Secretary, Ben Wallace, has ordered an investigation into a data breach which could threaten the safety of more than 250 people in Afghanistan. They include dozens of Afghan interpreters who worked for the British forces uh, over the past 20 years. The Ministry has referred itself to the Information Commissioner's office. One person has been suspended since the news broke last night. Our special correspondent, Lucy Manning, who uncovered the story, has the latest and uh, there are some flashing images coming up. They CC by mistake all the emails. It was an email that was supposed to reassure. Instead, it might have put Afghan interpreters at greater risk. When the Ministry of Defence sent the message to those still stranded, all 250 email addresses, some names and photos, could be seen by everyone receiving it. An interpreter we can't identify, currently in hiding in Afghanistan, received the email. I felt shocked, I really felt, you know, disappointed that how could they afford to make uh, this serious mistake. Just when you think it can't get worse than this, I'm 100% sure that it will have a negative impact on our safety. The interpreters have been told to change their email addresses. The Defence Secretary had to come to the Commons to explain. It was brought to my attention at 20 hundred hours last night there had been a significant data breach. To say, Mr Speaker, I was angered by this under, was an understatement and I immediately directed an investigation to take place. One official has been suspended. I apologise to those Afghans affected by this data breach and with whom we are now working with them to provide security advice. There is no guarantee that this data is going to be on the safe hands. This stranded interpreter also received the email. Do you accept the Defence Secretary's apology for this? The apologise is not helping at the moment. As I say, they need to take action now, to start the, the, the process of evacuation. These mistakes uh, can cause the interpreter's life. The MOD's apology is sincere and staff are said to be distraught. But while the military evacuation was praised, the reality is hundreds of interpreters and others have been left behind in increasing fear and desperation with no clear path to get them out. The government admits it's lost contact with eight interpreters it couldn't evacuate. And it's not just the data breach, but the perceived breach of trust that's left lives at risk.
Whether am I going to be, uh, you know, end up in the UK or not, to be honest, I'm not uh, 100% sure. When I, you know, see their carelessness and their neglect, I don't think uh, we're going to be, you know, in, in the UK in the near future. But I'm still hopeful. Britain promises to get them out however long it takes, but every day is dangerous on the run from the Taliban. Lucy Manning, BBC News. Another village on the Canary Island of La Palma has been evacuated because of the ongoing eruption of a volcano and the flow of lava to the sea. The evacuation of the village of El Paso was ordered after lava started flowing from a new area of the Cumbre Vieja volcano. And more than 6,000 people have fled the area. Hundreds of homes have been destroyed since that eruption began on Sunday. Let's join our correspondent Dan Johnson on La Palma who can tell us what the latest is. Dan? Yes, Hugh, this volcano keeps doing its thing day and night, spewing ash and molten lava into the air, and the lava is flowing down the hillside. That's why there's a huge black scar now across the landscape here, where it has burned through trees, smothered roads, and destroyed villages. And there's been even more activity here overnight in terms of earth tremors, uh, which have put people on edge. So that is why the evacuation effort is being stepped up, and people are really fearful of what may still to become here. On La Palma's volcanic hillsides, it's time to move. More families and more communities are packing up and getting out. I don't even know where to take my things, this woman says. We were allowed to drive the road to Todoque, a village evacuated on Sunday now being cleared by its residents in a last dash to grab whatever they can before the lava consumes their homes. And at times, there's a sense of panic here. Basilio's desperately trying to help his dad pack up. Antonio's lived here over 40 years, and he told me he can't believe it's ending like this. I am angry with the authorities. We could have done this without so much stress, without running. I don't know where I'm going to live. And now what? This is the slow motion menace of molten lava, inching relentlessly downhill. It's a live geology lesson of nature's unstoppable force. The flames and the lava are really close. That's why there's such a risk to these properties and why people are making every effort to get out. Being here for just a couple of minutes, you get a sense of the risk because there's ash falling on my clothes. I can taste it in the air. And the whole time, there's the thunderous rumble of the volcano in the background. So that is why people are loading up and going. Because here's what's to come. Villages are being lost and others will have to be abandoned. So far, people are safe but leaving is painful, because it's not just buildings. The eruption is shaking everything, communities, families and lives. Dan Johnson, BBC News, La Palma. Prince William has been revealing one of the favourite practical jokes of his late grandfather, the Duke of Edinburgh, uh, that uh, he used to play on younger members of the family in a BBC One documentary to be shown tomorrow night. William and his cousins uh, Zara Tyndall and uh, uh, Peter Phillips recounted a game that involved squirting mustard, uh, much to the Queen's displeasure. Our royal correspondent Nicholas Witchell tells us what to expect. As well as assisting the Queen, he has a separate and independent job of his own. He ran his public life from this office in Buckingham Palace. He loved the latest technology and, of course, he was famously forthright. And he brought that same no-nonsense approach to most things, even to the royal family's barbecues, at which, inevitably, he took charge. He adored it, barbecuing. And if I ever tried to do it, he'd, I could never get the fire to light or something ghastly. So, go away! <laughs> And the barbecues were the perfect place for practical jokes. One of the games he used to enjoy playing was uh, when we used to go for family barbecues. Um, instead of a, uh, like a mustard pot, we had a mustard tube, a squeezy mustard tube. Um, and he used to take the lid off and put it in your hands. He gets you to hold it. He gets you to hold it in, in your hands and the lid's off. And I can't remember exactly what he says, but he ends up 
slamming your hands together. And then you squish your hands together to fire the mustard into the ceiling. It goes ceiling all over, it went all over the, the ceiling. On the ceiling. He used to get in a lot of trouble for my grandmother for covering most of the places uh, we had lunch and things with mustard on the ceiling. And I actually think the marks are still there. From, yeah, I think yeah. so. You know, he enjoyed those jokes. He enjoyed messing around with the children and, uh, and kind of um, being a grandfather. The Duke of Edinburgh, fondly remembered by his family. Nicholas Witchell, BBC News. I think it's time for a look at the weather. Here's Helen. Hugh, thanks very much. It's hardly felt like autumn today. The Auckland equinox will come on us tomorrow. We've just had this abundance of sunshine, 20 to 22 degrees Celsius, just some fair weather cloud. Yes, we've got a little bit more cloud up across the west of Scotland and Northern Ireland, but the main rain player is sitting out towards the west. So just a few dribbles of drizzle as it drifts southwards into Northern England overnight. Stays breezy, that rain arriving later. Across southern areas, under the starry skies, a little bit of mist and fog, and quite cool, actually, in rural areas, down to 6 or 7 degrees Celsius. But for most, it's a mild night, particularly in the north, because you've got that breeze and all that cloud and more significant rain coming in. Heavier rain over the hills for a time here. Once the mist and fog clears in the south, will be good spells of sunshine first thing. We'll tend to find a little bit more cloud drifting further south, that weak weather front here. The rain, though, easing as it heads into Northern Ireland and Southern Scotland, later replaced by brighter skies towards the north, but slightly chillier. Whilst further south, like today, 20 to 22 degrees Celsius, despite a bit more breeze around, but then it gets really quite windy tomorrow evening, as I say, right on cue for the autumn, autumn equinox, with some gales forecast across the north. And as this cold weather front invades further south, we could just have a brief incursion of something rather chilly. Temperatures significantly down on what they have been recently, but it doesn't last long and it's mostly for the north and the east of Scotland. We never really get into that cooler air in the south, a little bit more cloud mulling around, the fog as well. But the wind switches back round to the southwest or the south later in the day and that's the setup really for the weekend. So briefly chillier, particularly for the Northern Isles, but then 2021 quite widely across the southern areas, even into the weekend with just a little bit of showery rain in the west. Helen, many thanks once again. That's all from BBC News at 6. It was goodbye from me. On BBC One, we join our news teams where you are. Bye for now.